The year is 1984, dawn of the Apple Macintosh. The Mac wows the world with a graphical user interface and something called a mouse. It's revolutionary, but it wasn't Apple's first try. This is the Lisa released a year before. It's pretty hard to find one these days. They were only sold for about two years. But you can find Lisa's design influence everywhere because it helped create computing as we know it. When Apple started working on the Lisa in the late 1970s, personal computers asked a lot more of users. Some models, like the Apple II, were hugely successful, but learning them was a commitment. Most computers were command line oriented. You type something at a computer and it types some, usually complained, but <laughs> you know, it was, it was sort of a textual interaction. That's interface designer Bill Atkinson from an interview with the Computer History Museum. He and others at Apple knew that if they wanted to widen the appeal of computers, they'd need to evolve beyond that command line to something more visual. We're going to try our best to show you rather than tell you about this program. Visual interfaces actually date back to the 1960s and an engineer named Douglas Engelbart. In this now famous 1968 demo, Engelbart teases the earliest glimpses of modern graphically driven computing. Windows, hyperlinks, even the mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way and we never did change it. These then futuristic ideas were picked up by research lab Xerox PARC and built into a prototype called the Alto. The Alto boasted overlapping windows and pop-up menus driven by a mouse. Apple co-founder Steve Jobs learned about the Alto and cut a deal with Xerox to see it. The system blew him away, and he returned to Apple with a new zeal for visual interfaces. Within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this. The designers at Apple took a lot of inspiration from the Alto and beyond. They checked out a room-sized experimental interface called Dataland at MIT, which you flew around with a touchscreen and a joystick, and an IBM concept called Picture World, full of office analogs. You actually sealed your emails in a virtual envelope and dropped them in an outbox. Apple thought of office workers as its big new market, so it felt natural to make a computer that worked like a virtual desktop, which is exactly what the Lisa became. The Lisa was Apple's vision for everything an office computer should be. It was so full of new concepts that Apple produced a demo video explaining everything. Now, you can think of it as being like your office with a desktop and other office fixtures. Here's a place to store information, a folder, and a place to get rid of information, a waste paper basket. Looking back from 2023, these ideas are second nature. Icons, drop-down menus, pop-up windows. If you've used any personal computer, you basically know how to use a Lisa. Sort of. Oh God, it made a noise. Oh. Some of it's more literal than we're used to. You don't technically launch applications. Instead, you have these stationary pads with different kinds of paper. Writing paper for a text file, rows and columns for a spreadsheet. To start a new document, you tear off a virtual sheet. It is funny that this is so focused on neatness, but it does still put the default document in the messiest possible place. The way files move around is really literal too. The Lisa shipped with a hard drive called the Profile, which Apple took pains to connect to the real world. First, we'll select and open the Profile. You keep the folders in there, right? Right, it's just like a filing cabinet. To work on a document, you first move it to the desktop like you would in your office, and then open it up. When you're done, you can put it away, which saves, closes, and files the document away again. It does everything with these long animations so you can follow along. Apple figured multitasking was important for office workers, so if you've got multiple documents open, you can just do the thing that feels natural and click the new window. And all these apps play by basically the same rules. A lot of these things that we discovered were a matter of trial and error, not inventing it right the first time. We bumbled into the Lisa user interface one mistake at a time. Bill Atkinson documented the Lisa development process in a series of Polaroids, so you can look back and see how a lot of these tools developed. The folder tabs were actually shaped like folder tabs with a little curve to them. And 
when you shrunk one down, it'd go back into the drawer. We think of a folder now as a container that other things go inside of, but we were confused about that at the time. Mm -hmm. And so we actually thought of this as a folder, but had text in it instead mm -hmm. of having other things in it. Sometimes solutions created new problems, which led to even better ideas. At one point, we had uh, little pull-down menus on each window. But the problem is, if the window was over on the side, you couldn't get all of the titles. And if it was near the bottom, you couldn't get all of the items. They moved the menus to the top of the screen, but that made users drag their mouse a long way. The solution to that was another now ubiquitous feature. When you move the mouse faster, the cursor moves farther. So a rapid flick would take you right up to the top. These weren't all brand new mechanics. You can see similar ideas in, for instance, the 1981 Xerox Star. But Apple's ideas often feel more refined. This demo video for the star shows you how to move an icon with a click, and then a keystroke, and then a second click. Using the Move key, you can arrange your desktop in any way you like. Apple's version was the one that lasted, drag and drop. Apple, well, it put a lot of work into the Lisa, but that wasn't the only project on the table. But what I'd like to do now is, is show you the Macintosh in person. Apple developed the Lisa in parallel with the Macintosh, though with very different intent. Well, the Mac came out only one year after the Lisa, okay? It was a, a baby Lisa. It was, how do we make the Lisa affordable? How can we also make it um, now, not only lower cost, but less stiff? Hmm. We're trying to make the Lisa for an office worker. We were trying to make the Mac for a 15-year-old. Uh, even so, the Mac team borrowed people and ideas from the Lisa. And Apple advertised the Mac as having advanced Lisa technology in a far cheaper, stripped-down product. And using the Mac, it's hard to see it as anything but a baby Lisa. There are little tweaks. The housekeeping menu is gone, and the now famous Apple menu has appeared. The Mac acknowledges the existence of applications, but it couldn't run multiple apps at the same time. This is what switching apps looked like on a Mac. Give it just a moment. <laughs> As a reminder, here's multitasking on Lisa. It's so much fun getting to see the ability to have multiple apps open at the same time as this cool luxury that was backtracked upon and not brought back until later. <laughs> Still, the trade-offs Apple made paid off. The Mac ran faster than the Lisa, and it cost thousands of dollars less. Apple went all in on the Mac in 1984, and it quietly discontinued the Lisa a year later. Once the desktop metaphor got its hooks into the industry, it didn't let go. Microsoft Windows arrived in 1985, while Mac OS kept evolving. Today, it can be hard to imagine computers turning out any other way. Let's experience the world of Windows 95. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. Dude, you're getting in Dell. Of course, nothing lasts forever. Hey Siri, start a new note. What do you want it to say? Notes on Lisa script. Voice assistants and search have become a bigger and bigger part of computing, routing people around the desktop. Mobile phones still use files and folders, but we rarely have to think about them or see them. And with the rise of AI chatbots, AR and VR, the last vestiges of Engelbart's world of windows and mice might finally vanish. In short, the era of the desktop metaphor might finally be ending. But no matter what becomes of user interfaces, Lisa's design legacy shines through. It taught Apple that computers should be built for people, not the other way around. Sometimes there are ideas in the air, and the right person puts up a catcher's mitt and catches the idea. And if they didn't, somebody else would have caught it. Things would have progressed in that direction. But the Lisa contributed toward the idea that computers were for everyone. If you're really curious about the Lisa now, you're in luck. We've got a big documentary coming about its life, death, and afterlife. It's a story of politics, personal grievances, and a clandestine burial in a Utah landfill. That's all coming soon, so stay tuned. <laughs>